In this video, we'll be talking about the Department of Justice Special Condition on Determination of Suitability for Covered Individuals Who May Interact with Participating Minors. I know most of you have been working on this already, and that's great. We want to provide as much information as we can, so hopefully this video will provide a little more clarity. This condition went into effect in federal fiscal year 2019, so it's been in place for quite a while. There's been some confusion about how to properly apply this condition, but in the last few months, we've received some guidance from OVC and the VOCA Center and feel prepared to help subrecipients of federally funded grant awards come into compliance. There are a few things we need to cover today. We'll talk about which agencies the condition applies to, some definitions of keywords, who needs the determination within an agency, what you need to do for, that, for each of those individuals and how to make the determinations. They'll also be talk about documentation requirements and what you can expect from UOVC. So the first step in this process is to determine whether or not your organization must comply with this condition. Most subrecipients of federal grants from the OVC are compelled by this condition with only a few exceptions. That is due to the nature of the work you do in providing direct services to crime victims. So questions to ask yourself in making this decision. First, are any of the activities under your award intended to benefit minors? If your program plan involves services to minors, you can stop here because you are in the club. However, it doesn't have to be in your program plan for you to qualify. Second, is the intent of your program to serve the adult or general population, but it's expected that minors might participate? If so, then you are also a new proud club member. When thinking about this, think about what services you provide. Are some of your secondary victims minors? Are you likely to interact with minors if you're called out on scene? Have minors accompanying their parents to a shelter? Um, will a minor need interviewed for court? Expect that minors are likely to call your hotline would be another reason why you would qualify um, under this condition. So you don't have to set out with the intent to serve minors, but if the work you do is likely to have minors participate, then you're in. The last question to ask yourself is, um, if you're still not convinced that you need to comply, is, is, is it reasonable to believe that you'll be interacting with minors while carrying out your program plan? If so, welcome. If you made it through all of those without saying yes, then congratulations, you may not need to comply with this condition, but you're welcome to call the staff um, at UOVC to staff it with us if you are unsure. So we're going to identify a few key words um, and their definitions that will help you in answering some of the questions that we just talked about. So first is who is a participating minor? The definition is fairly clear on this. It's all individuals under 18 in programs where some or all of the activities carried out under the program are to benefit minors. So a participating minor is anyone under 18 involved in your funded programs services in some way. Next is how the word interact is meant to be interpreted. We're happy to get, we were happy to get some clarification on this because it can be interpreted in many ways. The guidance we were given about this condition says that interact includes physical contact, oral and written communication, transmission of images and sound. It might be in person or by electronic means. So basically this is any form of communication. It could be an incoming or outgoing phone call emails, text messages, in-person conversations, or maybe you're holding a sign up in the air with a group of minors in the room. That doesn't mean that everyone who walks past a minor in the building or answers the phone at the front desk needs to have a determination made. Interact does not mean brief contact that is unexpected or unintentional. For example, if you have a board member walking through the building when you happen to be meeting with minors for a group activity, that board member is not expected to turn around and go the other way to avoid interaction. In this case, the interaction would be brief and unexpected. Last definition we're gonna talk about is clarifying what activities under the award means. In this case, it means that the activity is fully or partially paid for with federal funds from the award. Um, that could also be matching funds um, that are included in your approved budget and include activities carried out under the award or actions taken by an entity or individual subcontracted through the award. So if you contract out some of your services to another agency, you're responsible to ensure that they are following this condition as well. So to be clear, this condition applies to staff working in the grant funded program, whether or not their name is on the award. If you have 10 people working in your program, 
um, but only three are covered under the grant. All 10 still need to have the determination made because they're working in the program that is covered by the award. If your organization has multiple programs, this applies only to the programs that are partially or, or fully funded under the award, but not necessarily your entire organization. It also includes any non-paid staff who are expected or reasonably likely to interact with participating minors. Um, board members are a good example of some unpaid staff in most cases. Uh, this also includes your contractors and consultants and their employees, a trainee, a volunteer, things of that nature. If someone is going to assist with the federally funded program in any way, and they're reasonably expected to interact with participating minors, then you need to do a determination um, on them before they have that interaction. That doesn't mean everyone who walks through your doors. It specifically does not include other minors, clients, parents of the minors, or others who may be around but are not expected to interact with those minors. So once you've determined that this condition applies to you and you've identified who needs a determination of suitability, you still need to know what it takes to make that determination. And it's not really as complicated as it, as it sounds on paper. First, you've got to do a fingerprint-based criminal history search that includes the state you're providing services in, as well as any state the individual has lived, worked, or gone to school in for the past five years. And your search needs to cover at least the past five years. If you want to do a national fingerprint-based search so that all the states are covered, that's great. It's a preferred way to do it, but it's not required. You can just choose to do individual states. You've got to determine what works best for your agency. And once you get the criminal history check results back, you need to review it to ensure that the individual does not meet any of the disqualifying factors. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. So next you need to do a name-based search of the public sex offender and child abuse registries again, for the state you're providing services in and any states the individual has lived, worked, or gone to school in for the past five years. If a state that you need to check the registries on doesn't have a public registry, then you just document that. Some states do not have public registries. Utah does have a public sex offender reg and kidnap registry that you can access through the Utah Department of Corrections website. Some states have public child abuse registries and some don't. Utah just recently started a child abuse registry that is also managed by the Department of Corrections, so you'll need to add that to your search as well. You also are required to check the National Sex Offender Registry, and you can find that registry online by doing a quick search. So at a minimum, you need to check the sex offender and child abuse registries for Utah, do a fingerprint-based criminal history search for Utah, and check the National Offenders Registry. And anything beyond that would be based on the individual that you're making the determination on. Keep in mind that you can do searches all day long, but if you don't document it, it's not going to do you any good, and you're going to end up having to do it all again. So we'll talk about those documentation requirements in a little bit as well. An individual can make your decision simple by know, knowingly withholding consent for a required search or knowingly making false statements to affect a required search. If they do either of these things, you must determine them to be unsuitable to interact with minors. Um, also, if your search results find that they're listed as a registered search sex, offend, sex offender, that also disqualifies them. And if you learn that a local, federal, state, or tribal government agency has already determined the individual to not be suitable, you cannot find them suitable they're automatically disqualified. Once you receive the fingerprint-based criminal history results, you have to check for these sp for specific types of crimes. And it doesn't have to have these same names. It just needs to be a crime that is in this particular category. Um, most law enforcement agencies um, use different names based on the jurisdictions to categorize crimes. But this list shows pretty well um, the types of crimes that are exclusion that are excluding people from being determined suitable. So you've got the sexual or physical abuse, neglect or endangerment of a minor, rape, sexual assault, sexual exploitation, voyeurism, or conspiracy to commit one of those crimes, and kidnapping. If a conviction for one of those types of crimes um, shows up on their uh, criminal history search, then they're not suitable to interact with minors in your program. So these, if they are disqualified because of one of these reasons, it doesn't mean that they can't work for your agency. It just means that you need to ensure that whatever their job is doesn't um, involve any access for them to be able to interact with participating minors. Okay, so let's talk about the documentation requirements. Your agency can determine how they want this to be documented, but it must be available for our review upon request. The mandatory minimum requirements for documentation are the name of the individual that the determination is being made for, 
the date of each of the checks. So the criminal um, background check, the sex offender and child abuse registries, the national sex offender registry, you need to have the date that each of those was checked. And then you need to make a determination, was this person suitable or not suitable? Um, and that needs to be documented as well. The name of the individual who made the determination also needs to be on there. And that needs to be a person who has an adequate understanding of the requirements and the program to be able to make that determination. So you do not need to send us this documentation once it's done. You just need to maintain it on hand internally and provide it when requested. If we come out for a site visit, then we'll probably ask for it then, we'll just view it on site. If we don't have a site visit, then we may ask for a copy of it during the desk review. What we don't want are copies of your background checks or copies of the offender searches. You don't have to keep them and we will not keep them. If you send them, we will delete them and let you know that we've deleted them. Um, that's information that we don't need and we want to maintain that um, privacy as much as possible. So you should have a policy that talks about what you're going to do with the search results. Um, and then you can maintain the actual results on within your organization, or you can choose to delete it or shred it. Either way, all that we're going to check is the documentation showing that you completed these checks. All right, we're almost done, but I wanna quickly cover a few things that you should know. First, this condition is only for the federally funded programs. If you're state funded only, you do not need to complete these determinations. The determinations must be made no more than six months after you complete the searches. So if an individual had a background check two years ago, you need to do a new background check in order to be able to make this determination. It needs to be made prior to interaction with minors. So if you have an employee who's transferring to work in the funded program from another program, then they need to have this determination made with the current and relevant information, meaning their checks must be done no more than six months prior. While you're waiting for those necessary searches um, to be able to make the determinations, they can still work within the program, but they need to be accompanied by someone who has been determined suitable, and that person should be within ear and eye shot of that minor at all times. And there is no grace period or grandfathered exception here. This um, went into effect in 2019. They didn't give an exception then, and they won't give one now. So this is something that you need to get going right away. So if an individual has a professional licensure, such as a licensed counselor or an attorney, they still have to do the determination. Licensure does not negate their requirement. If an individual had a background check done at another agency, it doesn't fill this requirement unless it was done no more than six months ago, and you can still ensure that their requirements were met, including the disqualifying factors being checked. So you would have to be able to view the actual results of that background check that the other agency did to ensure that none of those um, type crime types are on there. So remember that an individual does not have to work for your organization for you to have to make this determination. If you contract with a therapist, a nurse, or, or an attorney or something of that sort to complete activities under your award, then this determination is required for them. It does not include everybody that you refer clients to. So if you hand out a list of, of options for a client to access services, it doesn't mean that all of those people on your referral list need to be covered. But if your program plan includes contracted fees for therapy for minors, then the therapist you contract with must have had this determination made. And that is required for your agency, not theirs. Okay, so I think I've made it clear that the UOVC will be monitoring this condition. We are required to do that as the SAA and that is a condition of accepting federal awards to our state for crime victims. So I want you to make sure you know what to expect from us in regards to the monitoring of this condition. We'll just do a really brief overview. It doesn't need a lot of information. So at the beginning of each grant cycle, you'll receive a request asking you to certify whether or not the condition applies to your agency. And if it does, you certify that you will follow that this condition. That is something that I'm sure you all saw or someone in your agency saw because we have done those for this year. It'll generally go out within the first week or two of July after a new grant is awarded because we need to be able to show um, in our federal reviews that we are taking steps to ensure that all of our programs are meeting this condition. So we will review the documentation that you kept 
for the determinations. When you document everything that needs to be documented to make a determination, that's what we're gonna view um, when we come out. We'll check your agency policy to make sure that it requires that, um, that this condition be met for the programs that are federally funded. So I'm sure you're really tired of hearing about policies, but just know that your policy does need to include these requirements. Um, if you are not in compliance, then corrective action will be taken. That could include a variety of things based on the type of non-compliance, but this is something that we are taking really seriously. Um, it's about protecting the minors as well as meeting our federal requirements. So please, please take it seriously and work to get in compliance as soon as you reasonably can. So there's a lot of resources available to help you get in compliance. There's just a couple of them here on this screen. Um, feel free to reach out to us with any questions. I've got my name and email on here. And I really think that this isn't gonna be as complicated or scary as it has initially seemed. Um, I just wanna know that we're here to support you and help in any way we can. So I really appreciate your time today and I hope that the rest of your day is fantastic.